Thank you. Hey, it's a it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and I brought some hats and some pens, some magazines, and some membership applications for those of you all that uh, might not be a member. But uh, you know, I really thank Sarah for allowing us to come and talk a little bit about SME. And and Mark's got some great uh, information for you about the future of mining, which we're all interested in. Um, I will tell you this: I don't know. Um, I just happened to watch Sean Hannity last night on uh, Fox News, and uh, then the next hour is uh, Laura Ingram. Both of them talked about mining last night. Now, granted, none of them what the hell they're talking about, but they were both talking about it. Uh, so uh, mining is is really at the forefront of what we're going to do, I think, over the next uh, 15, 20 years in order to uh, to move towards this green economy. And uh, you guys are at a beautiful time to be coming into the industry, in my opinion. And uh, you guys have great career opportunities ahead of you. And uh, and we're we're very fortunate to have you guys coming into the mining industry um, in the next few years. So uh, stick with it, keep going. And if Hugh gives you any problems, you call me. And I'll take care. <laughs> yeah. All right. So uh, I just I'm going to do a little overview of SME for you. And then uh, Mark's going to talk a little bit about the future of mining. Uh, and then uh, we'll take all the questions you got. Uh, I already told a couple of my uh, students over here, not my students, but I got to meet them in uh, AEMA. They give me the softball questions and Mark gets the hardball questions. So, all right, Mark, what do we got for the next slide here? So SME's membership. Uh, Believe it or not, 25% of our membership is not in the United States. Uh, in fact, the fastest growing area of membership for, the United, for us is in South America. Uh, we, we have an uh, actual uh, small office in Peru with three people that work for us down there as staff. And so uh, our South American membership is, is growing quite quickly. Uh, you can see some other areas uh, around the world where we have membership and uh, and India is probably the next uh, hottest market for, for SME membership, students, professionals, et cetera. We have a little more than 13,000 members uh, worldwide. And primarily our membership is made up of uh, mining engineers, mineral processing engineers, and geologists. That's probably 75, 80% of the membership. We've let a few lawyers slip in by accident. We've uh, got a few civil engineers. We've got a few mechanical engineers. Everybody's welcome. Uh, um, and uh, so, you know, as people, as, as you get out into the industry and you talk to people that didn't come up through mining engineering, but they're working in our industry, we welcome them in as a, as a member of the society. So we have a very good local presence. And it's going to, I'm going to give you some statistics here. You're going to be surprised probably. Of the 46 local sections, 40 of them are in the United States, six of them are outside of the U.S. Two chapters, we have 76. 15 of those are inside the United States. The rest are outside of the US. Um, Peru, India, um, uh, Chile, uh, Canada, Australia. There's a, there we have a lot of student chapters outside of the US. And, uh, and in fact, we have more on the student side, we have more members outside of the US than we do inside of, of the US at this time. And then the last thing I want to say is that. We have student membership, professional membership, and registered members. Registered members are, are uh, members who have to qualify for years of service into the industry, years of experience and education in order to be a registered member. Um, it's what I would say the most elite uh, category of membership. However, these people are qualified to write 43101 standard sign. So um, it's, uh, there is a purpose uh, for that. All right, we want you to advance your career at SME, and that's what we're all about. We're about networking, we're about professional development, we're about uh, uh, really exchanging technology and information amongst our members, and we do that in a variety of ways, whether it be our magazine, Finding Engineer, uh, which comes out every month. Uh, this uh, month is a special issue because we have all the details about the SME annual meeting that's coming up in 10 days or so. So we we'll hope to see you downtown Denver in about 10 days. Um, and we, um, we have conferences, of course, webinars, uh, 
we put out books. So Mark with a book of books. So here is two brand new books that just came off the shelf uh, at some meetings. We just got in this fun bin. And we got an insurgents mining handbook and a uh, underground mining handbook. And two people are going to go home with these books because I'm not taking them back. <laughs> um, so we, we share knowledge in all kinds of ways. Um, we also have lots of industry professionals that are involved in, in all types of work, whether they're just the engineering staff of organizations or whether they're the management <laughs> operation of organizations. All those types of people are really involved in SME. And I think that one of the good things is, is that you can find your niche where you're comfortable in the society where you, you will find some friends, where you will find some colleagues, and those colleagues will help you out down the road in your career. You know, mining's a little cyclical, you know, so sometimes it's hiring and firing and hiring and firing, you know. Uh, and so, you know, you need your colleagues around you because you may get caught up in a situation that's not yours making, and you may be looking for an opportunity. And you know what? I think SME members always come to the rescue to make sure that their friends are re-engaged in the industry uh, in some way, shape, or form. One other thing that's very unique about SME is we're the only mining organization in the U.S. that covered every segment of the industry. So whether it's coal, hard rock, uh, industrial minerals, aggregates, underground construction, we cover it all at SME. And uh, we have people involved in all those different industries and, and uh, type of type, uh, opportunities. Um, find yourself a mentor. Um, it's really, really good. And I know there's lots of people that are willing to help younger people and help them get started and uh, start on the, on the right path. Another thing I wanna, I don't have a slide on this, but SME just finished a TV series called Jobs of Tomorrow. If you go to Free V, that's the Amazon free streaming service. You guys probably know that better than I do. Uh, you can search Jobs of Tomorrow and it'll come up and it'll be 24 episodes. The last six episodes, 19 through 24, are the ones that SME produced in that series of Jobs of Tomorrow. Uh, we talk about metallurgy jobs. We talk about data collection. We've talked about clean energy uh, and uh, urban mining, um, et cetera. So if you really have some a uh, few minutes, there are only 22 minutes each, and there's no commercials, uh, <laughs> you can go there and uh, you can watch those things. And it, they're really interesting. And all the people that spoke on those jobs of tomorrow, they're younger people, uh, half of them are male, half are female, et cetera, really giving their perspective of why they picked the mining industry, what they're doing in the industry, and how they're enjoying it. So, you know, one of the good things I think also about mining is, is if you want to be remote and don't want to be disturbed, you can find that in this industry. If you want to live in the city and have thousands of things to do, you can do that in this industry as well. So anyway, we, we, we really hope that you'll stay in the industry and we really look forward to having you. Um, probably one of the most valuable resources Destiny has is OneMind.org. This started in 19, or 2008, this started. Um, actually, it was an idea that we hatched because we just had hundreds of papers around the office. And if you called SME and said, hey, you know, Hugh Miller wrote a paper in 1989 in the May issue, no problem. We can find that for you. How would you like us to get it to you? PDF it, mail it to you, copy it, whatever you want. We can get it to you, no problem. If you said, I'm looking for a paper, I don't know who the author is, not exactly sure what the title is, don't know what year it was published, we have no chance of finding that paper for you at that time. So technology changed. We could um, digitize things and metadata tag them, put them in a search, and voila. So here's where staff and our volunteers, members like yourself, really work well together. Our concept was just to get SME's papers so that our members could look for them and find them. And one of our past presidents, give credit to George Luxbacher, he came up to me and goes, Dave, this is a fantastic idea. It would be better if we could get all the papers from all the societies around the world into the same database so that we could search all the papers in the world. And that's exactly what happened. It took a while for it to all come together, of course, but 
Now there's over 140,000 papers about everything in the mining industry, all the way back to 1871, where SME's roots originally were started. And, um, and we have 14 societies that have put their, their technology and their papers into one mine. So to me, I think this is one of the most valuable technical resources that SME has. And don't tell you this, but when he gives you an assignment, just go to one mine. Don't bother yourself. Not that easy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, all right. Then the second best thing we've done probably, and it was only done this last year, was we took that same concept and put it into Taylor's portal. As you all well know, tailings and waste management, or what mine waste are a real, real problem right now. It's, it's something we got to take more seriously in our industry, and people are taking it more seriously because there's been too many accidents, and the accidents lead to bad press and 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 fatalities, and we don't want that. And so, anyway, we created this standard portal, so you go to the repository there, find the type of information you're looking for, and. You're, and uh, uh, tailings, click on it, it'll take you to the abstract, and then you can go further into it. And just like one mind, you can find the, the uh, paper or the video or whatever it might be that uh, you're connected to. So, this is actually the second best technical tool we provided, in my opinion. So, don't tell our editor I said that. <laughs> <laughs> we also have a career center. You're going to graduate someday, we hope. And uh, you're gonna to wanna to look for an opportunity in the, in the industry. We have a career center on our website. Go there, look, you can put in your resume. You can, come, you can see what kind of jobs are available and, uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, describe what you wanna do, what your area of expertise is, et cetera. And they'll match you up and find opportunities uh, where, uh, where they're, they're available. So my last comment. The mining industry is a wonderful industry. The people are the salt of the earth as far as I'm concerned. I've enjoyed every minute of my 19 years at SME. But I'll tell you this, I encourage you to come in with the right attitude, be willing to do things and go places because you're gonna get that opportunity in this industry. And uh, it's going to help your career. It's going to expand your knowledge. You're going to get to work with all kinds of people in all different types of places around the world. And uh, there's no better global industry, as far as I'm concerned, than the mining industry. And I will tell you that the mining industry has sent me to every continent of the world, except Antarctica. I'm still figuring out how to get there. I think I could have gotten there because I happened to be flying to New Zealand and sitting next to a researcher that was going down to Antarctica. <laughs> and I really wanted to ask him if I could come along. But uh, anyway, it's it really is a great opportunity and, and you guys have a, a, a super, super um, career ahead of you in the mining industry. So thank you for allowing me to be here. I'm happy to take any questions after Mark tells you about the future of mining. <laughs> All right, thank you everybody for your uh, coming to the station. Uh, opportunity to talk to you a little bit about the different things that uh, we have going on in the mining industry. A little bit of background, you don't want to look at this too long, um, but uh, I went to Michigan Tech, uh, which still has a mining program. Uh, they ran to do a while back, but um, uh, I've moved all over the United States and overseas uh, in my career and, and uh, been fortunate to work with a lot of great people and work in a whole lot of different systems, right? as you can see there, and uh, different mineral systems. And the um, biggest and longest run was with Newmont. I worked for engineered equipment companies as well as um, mining companies. And uh, the longest one was the last one with uh, Newmont, where I was uh, director of research and development, technological research and development. And I spent some time with a couple of juniors that were focused on rare earths. That's another story itself. <laughs> but um, we, we can answer any questions about that later. Um, the, um, the big thing here I want to point out is the enormous number of connections the enormous number of colleagues and friends that you will acquire. You don't even know 
what you're about to enter into. And I can tell you it's a good thing. It's really great. So when you think about the future of mining, you're thinking about people you don't even know yet that are going to become your best friends. People you're going to go to when you got a problem. And as Dave said, if you get caught up in a layoff, don't make it personal about business. Things happen. Prices decrease. Can't predict them. But the bottom line is there's always going to be somebody out there who can for you. Okay? And it's a very, very tight-knit um, community that looks out for each other. <laughs> Um, the future money in the 21st century economy. I told Dave <laughs> right after Sarah and I was doing this about the later that comes, I'm like, I'm glad we're ahead of silver and we're not behind it because I'm not going to show up. <laughs> Doug is a very good friend and a very dynamic speaker and he was a lot of fun and he's, he's very talented. Um, the, the main comment is future money is bright. We have a lot of things going on in the mining industry. I'm going to do a very high level talk. We're not going to get down in the weeds about protesting or, or mining activity and rare earths, but we're going to talk at a high level why it's important, and where the opportunities are for you uh, in this industry. It's right because there's a lot of things that people want to do that aren't being done. In addition, we have, and we'll talk about it a little more, baby boomers retiring. Okay. And everybody's going up, and there was there was act, actually a a big dip, you know, uh, over the years of the people coming into mine, and then there was a, a peak behind that. So you can imagine a peak here of baby boomers, and a peak here of of like uh, Gen Xers and, and a few millennials, but it's still not as big. So there's a big shortage, and as we move through there, there's opportunities that are going to accelerate you into positions. You may not have the experience for it. You're going to need a mentor, right? Uh, because you're going to get promoted, maybe ahead of the curve because they have to. But we need to fill these people. We need to backfill and bring more people in because there's new things coming. And as you'll see as we go through this, it's an enormous task. And every one of you are involved. Every one of you are going to be an ambassador for money. And uh, you have to bring your friends, families, dogs, whatever. So you've got one. Um, Critical minerals are required in all phases of life. We all know it starts with money. Everything starts with money. And it is what makes the quality of life that you have today, what you enjoy today. Not everybody's as fortunate as we are, but the world is expanding and the world wants that same quality of life. And so the infrastructure is already increasing and improving all the time. That demands more minerals. I can tell you in 19. Get home. In 1991, I went to Peru for the first time. It was Stein, not Stein. We were about to embark on a project, and nobody wanted to be there in management because they had a thing, they had a, a real revolution going on. They had a lot of terrorists, a lot of, a lot of fight, civil war. The Sendero Luminoso were blowing things up, right? And uh, But we had an opportunity. And I can tell you the difference I saw once we put that gold mine in place to when I went back five years later was enormous. I mean, you can't, I mean, I'll just give you a quick example. It was like, like right through the streets of a civil war in torn country like in Beirut, Lebanon, many years ago, to going back and having to walk out of the airport after you got your bags. And there was a Lexus dealership. Mercedes dealership, and it's like, really? And I'm, I'm serious, you couldn't drive a straight line because the roads are so bad, the infrastructure is so bad. And, and all of this money started flowing in, all the revenue started flowing in and brought the economy back. Um, so, quality of life, strategic defense. Um, the attorney minerals are involved in strategic defense. We get into that a little bit. And energy, yeah, that's basically what everybody's here wants to hear a little bit more about. Um, but we, you know, new forms of energy that we possibly haven't done a lot of before that are going to require a lot of minutes um, and a lot of uh, uh, new production, new mines. Okay, Dave. <laughs> Just use the arrows on the keyboard. There you go. Okay, so natural resources for energy 
Uh, we're talking about coal, petroleum, natural gas, star sands, oil shale, uranium, and thorium. Um, these are the classical. Uh, thorium is a is is something we'll talk a little bit about. Uranium, of course, nuclear power. Oil shale. Um, there's still a lot of potential in oil shale for energy, and who knows, may even still get developed someday. Um, the tar sands in Canada, natural gas, which are, these are the classical, and they're going to continue. I mean, I hear all the banter about ending fossil fuels, but last year we sold, they exported and sold more coal than they ever sold, and the revenues were record highs. Prices are up, um, and, and it's going to continue. Um, there'll be, you know, it may not be thermal coal, but there's going to be, there's going to be uh, medical, medical is big right now, and uh, it's going to continue. And, uh, and, and there's a lot of research going on in that area. And uh, we'll get into the a little bit later. Go ahead, Dave. You know, we try to make sure we appease all the divisions within the SME, the mineral <laughs> processes, the mining engineers, and we have a group called Coal Energy. So we'll make sure that, uh, and it's an underground mine. And with the advent of long wall mining, uh, it's a great shot. And, you know, people think that coal mining, they think, a guy's going down a hole and, and little dollies, you know, bringing the coal out, you know. Uh, it, it takes a lot of technology. Think about all the different disciplines it takes to operate it, to maintain it, and to plan it. Okay. And so you're going to talk about opportunities. There's all kinds of disciplines involved with this. Okay. And, you know, there's the production. I'm sure you've seen the, the unit trains. Heads to the various power plants here. Uh, these unit trains uh, are continuing, and thank goodness on a day like today, they're keeping the swarm and keeping the lights on. Um, but that's a that is a pretty picture to anybody that works in coal. I've worked in coal uh, for a long time, servicing equipment. At one point, I was at every uh, wash plant, as they call them, processing plant east of the Mississippi. Uh, up until 1989, when I joined Newmont, and then we forgot about coal and went to gold. So, thanks to me. Um, as I mentioned, the 2022 coal sales with record revenues and export volumes. Last year, there was 8 billion tons of coal stolen. You just heard that yesterday. Worldwide. Huh? Worldwide. 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 Yeah. Globally. Guess where 50% of it was consumed? China. Okay. Uh, and then I think India was the number number two, but was right behind that. Okay. Um, China's on schedule to build 76 new coal fired megawatt power plants this year. They did uh, 73, they did 46 last year. And each year they're going to be doing about another 73. They're, they're looking to electrify their entire country because there's lots of areas that aren't. Uh, there's a lot of research grants out there for graphene production from coal. There's grants on that are being explored for recovering rare earths from coal refuse and uh, a few other uh, side uh, waste products and tailings. Um, Bill Gates looking at a molten salt reactor um, a grant that he got with a dental facility up in, in Wyoming. And, uh, you know, I saw some of these down in uh, Los Alamos. When we were down there looking at what we could do for a technology exchange between Newmont and, and uh, government funded research. And one of the things we saw was one of these water, heavy water reactors or molten salt reactors, they're self generative and they just keep operating. You build it, you put it in the ground, you seal it, and you, there's no maintenance, it just keeps running. It can, one of these plants can. And provide the power to a village of 50,000 people for 50 years. Okay. And they're scalable. Uh, carbon capture and then sequestration research. There's a lot of work. There's a lot of work going on on how we can improve coal. So don't count coal out. Coal's going to be around for a long time and a lot of good products. There's going to be a big shortage. If you go into the EVs and stuff with batteries, you're going to need, you're going to need coal. You need graphite, right? So, Dave, um, nuclear by far, and, and we're, I don't know, generation four or five in, in nuclear plant designs that are so much further ahead of some of the ones that have had trouble. 
Um, just like uh, Fukushima uh, in Japan, that was not the latest. And the ones today, from what I'm told, are, are much safer and, and easier to operate. And uh, you, we still have to be responsible. There's still things we have to do with the spent fuel rods and um, go from there, Dave. Okay. And then we get into alternative energy sources um, that we're looking at today. This is going to create more demand for critical minerals, the wind turbines and the solar panels. And it's all about what's in there. So for the next slide, Dave. Here's a quick shot of a wind turbine and some of the minerals involved in a wind turbine. And I'm still with pride on these slides um, that have been used a number of times by others. Um, but you can see just in the frame alone, you've got bauxite, you've got coal, and iron ore, and manganese, and vanadium, and aluminum, wiring and circuitry, copper. Copper is not even on the critical minerals list. And it should be. NMA, National Mining Association, got a big push right now to have the government add copper to that critical mineral list. Tom said, you can see all the different things involved. One of the big things is the magnets and, and the motors that and the motor drives um, with rare earths. Uh, and they're very, very powerful. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't take a whole lot to make a magnet in terms of quantity, but um, rare earths are not rare. They're everywhere. They're plentiful. It's rare to find it in, in a large concentration. They're all very low grade, which means you got to process a lot. And the economics become very challenged. So, yeah. solar, you know, a lot of push to go to solar power. There's a lot of that happening on individual homes. And then the next slide, of course, you can see that um, there's a lot. If you go out to the airport, DIA, you see solar panels. If you go down here to, to the uh, USGS uh, government facility, you see fields of these things. Um, and they're massive. My side comment to this is I never saw the EIS. <laughs> and a permitting time to get that done is a hell of a lot less than the 12 years it takes us to do a mine if we're lucky. Um, some of the products, uh, fact sheet put out by uh, the ABC Growth Minerals Education Coalition. Um, you can see a number of the different minerals that are involved. Tellurium are in the, it's in the solar cells. Titanium, silica, uh, selenium, um, arsenide, gallium arsenide semiconductor chips. Um, and, uh, it, you know, when in copper, you know, it, and part of the problem is you can get the grid. You can get the power they generate to the grid. And the grid, and the best places for solar doesn't necessarily need to be close to the grid. So that's another expense. So these are all the things that go into that project assessment. It's not like snapping your finger. Or waving the magic wand, and uh, it gets done. Uh, so there's there's a number of critical minerals involved, and in the solar. And if we're going to do more solar, it's going to put the stress load. You know, if you want to put copper pipes in your house, if we're not producing enough copper, you're going to double or triple the cost of building the house. Okay. okay. Of course, there's a lot of talk about EVs. This is a uh, BMW version, um, pretty hot car. And these things are quick. I mean, the torque that these magnets in the drives, the motors put out is extremely fast. I've got some friends that have them, and they said, You have to learn to drive them. You don't jump in and start driving, you'll kill yourself. Because the, the pedal, I mean, just trying to put the accelerator to it, 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 it stopped. It's a whole nother. Uh, dimensions, so you have to kind of learn how to drive them, but they are hot, there's no doubt. And cold weather, they don't recharge. Well, okay. <laughs> yeah. minor, minor detail, right? So, um, some of the minerals involved, this slide actually says the minerals that are involved in the test, the big one right here. Electric car uses uh, three times more copper than an internal combustion vehicle, okay? Again, uh, wiring circuitry, you got golden ball, plot, tungsten, um, rare earths. Now it says niobium. Niobium is not really a rare earth oxide. I don't call it rare earth. But neodymium, one of the biggest and most critical is the neodymium, um, the iron 
neodymium boron magnets that are made. And you can produce rare earths like neodymium and in an oxide. Then you have to get it to a metal. Then you got to get it to an alloy. An, an, an alloy. Okay. And so then the alloy comes in with the iron, but they're also, you know, these magnets break down and generate a tremendous amount of heat. You can think of all that torque, all that energy. And so it breaks the, it breaks down um, the integrity of the magnet and it falls apart. And so they found by alloying, uh, alloying more things like praseodymium and terbium into them, or dextrosium and, and praseodymium and a little bit of terbium. Terbium is better than dextrosium in terms of dissipating heat. And so they're still playing with those combinations. But, um, and those are all critical rare earth oxides uh, <laughs> that are required. And where does it come from? China. And we've got a rare earth mine. I'm sure you've had some lectures about that. We've got a rare earth mine, Mountain Pass, that started back up. And the products go where? China. So our dependence uh, on these minerals is very important. We have to look at it. And we'll get into a couple of slides here. Go ahead, Dave. Cell phones, the popular ones. Guys are all connected here, but they're now putting street signs on the ground because everybody's walking. Where am I? Oh, there's Smith Street. Okay. So, cell phones. Go ahead, Dave. A little bit of information about cell phones. Of course, you got silicon in the display, potassium, rare earth minerals, the LED lighting, the battery. When you put your phone on silent and it vibrates. Every you know what causes that? A little rare earth bank. That's what makes that vibrate. Okay. And it's milligrams, but we don't have any. Right? So, and then you get into recycling, you start thinking about recycling. You don't want to throw this stuff away. Then how do you recycle it? And I know Mr. Anderson, Dr. Anderson, sorry. Dr. Anderson spends a lot of time on that and he talks a lot about it. And, and it's a whole new field and an emerging growing field. That's another opportunity. In here, uh, platinum, copper, again, copper, you know, and again, arsenic. Who would have thought our good have thought arsenic was even you know, okay? Um, so in a, in a EV, 19 major metals required. Wind turbines, roughly 15 major metals required from minerals. And so 15 to 20 critical minerals are required to produce heat, wind, and solar panels, not to mention a whole lot of other things. Okay. But this is all new in terms of mega production. And it will require, some are estimating upwards of 300 new mines somewhere in the world. They have to be staffed. And they said, you're entering a, you're coming into this industry in a time. That is, it's a great time. In addition to all this, we have to keep doing what we're doing with the, the uh, Marenzi's and the Climax Henderson's or the Climax uh, operations. Every mine you see, we have to keep doing that. I heard a fact that was presented at uh, uh, Arizona a while back. If you think about every pound of copper that's been produced since the Industrial Revolution, Again, to today, 2023, February 15th. Take that number and do it again by 2050. By 2050. So there's a monumental task here. I submit, personal opinion, that there will be a strategy that will eventually emerge, reality starting to sit in. And the strategy will then drive the, a, you know, the, a, a plan for the transition and the use of what's most effective where. And you'll keep many different tools in your toolbox, making sure that you're not using a crescent wrench to try to take a felt head screw out of a wall. Okay. Got to have the right tool for the right job. Okay. Some of the critical elements and the critical element list is how many? 45 or 48 now? Let's look at that. About 45. These are some on there. Hmm. Sorry, copper's not on. Copper's not on, copper's not on the list, but I put it on this list because it is a critical element. So as you look at these, <coughs> excuse me, 
as you went through, you can see the labeling of those critical minerals. They have to be mined. They have to come from somewhere. Okay. So copper, zinc, cobalt. Big source of cobalt right now. Big copper. She is coming out of the um, um, Republic of the Democratic Republic of Congo (DRC) uh, because of the work environment, um, things like that. So there's a big push to find new cobalt. Um, nickel, and you just can't use any nickel product in making batteries. There's a nickel um, specific grade and quality that has to be uh, met in order to make batteries. But you need nickel and a lot of other things too, alloys, whatnot. Um, rare earth elements we talked about. There's essentially 15 rare earth elements. I'll show you a slide of that here shortly. And aluminum, another big one. Okay. So I hope what I accomplished today is to just demonstrate to you an awareness of all the different things going on, how important it is to get this room doubled in size with students, okay? And, and get, get people with passion that want to be in this industry because it's exciting, it's fun, we do great things. We, you know, we're given demands of, you can't discharge water if the art sinks above this level, level, Charlie Buckman said to me one time, Yeah, we can't even measure that. And I said, We better find a way because we're not discharging water. And you know what? Charlie worked with some analytical companies, uh, equipment companies, and um, you know, the ASDM came up with a standard and, and uh, it was met. And uh, you know, we always make things better, we can always do better, but it's going to take people like you in this room. Get us there. You'll see in a minute. I'm done. Okay. <laughs> oh, go back once about this for a second. And what we're talking about is the lanthanides series. These elements in yellow. Now, the the colors refer to many years until completion. But there's those four. Um, those twelve. And then you have lanthanum over there, which isn't highlighted underneath yttrium. And some, and uh, so there's 13 here, and then those, those two. Some people throw scandium in. I'm not a big scandium guy. That's another story. But these are these are the rare earth elements you're talking about. And the heavies and the lights break at terbium, basically. Uh, everything to the left, gadolinium, uh, europium, and, and further down, those are the lights, lanthanum and cerium. And um, and then everything to the right is what they refer to as heavies. I look at what's critical. What's critical is terbium, dysrosium, um, trace of dimium over here, and neodymium, and um, um, samarium. There's still making some some samarium cobalt batteries, and uh, there's been a big increase in that too. So there's four or five that are really important. Okay, just real quick. Here's a list of, on the left, commodity, and on the right, where it's sourced from. Okay, that's the import. And this is our import reliance. And you can see the 100%. Okay, and you can see where it's coming from currently. And you see a lot of it. You see a lot of places like China. You see Canada. Um, and... Um, South Africa, places like that. But in, essentially, you can see what the dependence is. And this is the concern. We've been expressing this concern for many years. Can't do it all. Can't do it if you don't have it. But at the same time, um, there is a way to do it uh, on many of these. The next slide, Dave. And then uh, a further list showing uh, these are all ranked by uh, dependence. Uh, Reviculite, perlite, and zirconium are doing real good. Perlite. Um, and some lithium, but as lithium goes up in demand, okay, uh, our dependence on that is going to become much higher. Okay, okay next slide. So, you at the, the US for Earth's usage today, 62% um, going into catalysts, the chemical processing, uh, pollution, scrubbing, catalytic converters, uh, cracking towers, and, and petroleum refining is big. Um, 
13 percent go into the metallurgy, seven percent into magnets. That magnet section is going to erupt with EVs and other uh, the wind turbines, things like that. Uh, currently, it's pretty it's a low percentage. One of the things that's unique about distribution of rare earths, so those elements that we looked at on the periodic table, I don't care what order you're looking at. Historically, what I see, and everything can correct me if I'm wrong, but typically on rare earths that you are going to look at to produce that are amenable to processing, I don't care what where it comes from. 60 to 75 percent of the total rare earth distribution, and we refer to that as TRIO, total rare earth oxide. That distribution, 60 to 75 percent of it's going to be land from Syria. Kind of like, well, we don't need no more land from Syria, okay? Because I don't like the common past sitting on the ground. I've heard it sitting on the ground. It, it gets food, it gets sold, but it's, you know, in order to get the neodymium, you get the ones that are critical, you have to produce more rock, you produce more rock, you get more land from the city. And I think it's about a buck and a half a kilo right now, two two dollars a kilo. So the price on it, you know, are you gonna produce it? In some cases, the answer is no, and I'll tell you why. Thorium. Thorium is radioactive, and um, you have to get you have to handle that very carefully, very responsibly. And there is a way to drop the thorium out with the cereal. And uh, land them uh, and leave it behind and uh, dispose of it. And we had a we had a mine that we were developing at Great Western Minerals Group in uh, Western Cape. That's exactly what we were going to do. We we're going to we we're going to put it back into empty empty rooms that have been mined out and leave it there. This market for it just wasn't wasn't going to pay for it. So, okay. This is just a scattered plot of. Some of the known projects that are uh, where there's been drilling and announcements of discovery of, of rare uh, deposits in North America. And you can see that tells you it's very, you know, down in Florida, the Phosphate Association, right? Um, but not all of them are going to be economical. You know. So you can see there's going to be a huge opportunity just in rare earth, let alone all the other things. Go ahead, Dave. And so where does all it come from? It comes from mining. Everything comes from mining. You know, it's a, it's the start of everything. And if it isn't grown, it has to be mined. And if it's grown, you better have a mine product for it to make it grow better and fertilize it. So, um, shout out to thank you. Um, so, like, go ahead, Dave. Um, and as I said, you need mining. If you can't get excited about that, I don't know what you can get excited about, right? Because these companies are coming for you. These companies are going to come in for you. These companies are going to be looking for you. They're looking for leaders. They're looking for people that are going to be committed to working with them and, and have a great career with them. Um, this transition style economy will require over 300 new mines. We mentioned it. We figure there's over 300 mines going to be required to meet all these critical demands. Um, and the exploration hasn't even started yet in many cases. The exploration is still being bought by or trying to get permits for it. And these mines have to be exact and for you. And it's very important. And it's, it's like we're going to be right? Um, okay, next slide. So we're talking about the disciplines required. Exploration geologists, mining engineers, metallurgical engineers specialized in processing, hydrometallurgy extraction, material scientists, too. Um, that's not mining, but geotechnical engineer, environmental engineers, analytical chemists. I threw that one in for my life. Uh, but we need, you know, we always forget about the lab. We just manually put out results. She hates metallurgists, by the way. I don't know how I like that, but she they don't know anything, she says. But uh, we had great conversations. Um, we need IT engineers, computer scientists, we need mechanical engineers. I mean, there's a lot more I could have put on here. One of the greatest things I think you can do, my humble opinion, my, my impression, is whatever you decide to specialize in, go into mind. Because 
you know, we're paying, mining industry was cited recently as paying the, in the top five salaries coming out of college, okay, when you graduate. So they ranked the industries, and mining was in the top five, particularly metallurgy and, and mining is what they were looking at, but it's mining companies that will support that. And I think that's very important. And, and in my own opinion, it's, it's probably the greatest industry you can get involved with. I mean, it's just people are solid here and um, a great one to be in. Uh, Dave? So, we're talking about the human resource reality. Baby boomers are retired. And those are years that I was quoted. I made the cut. I won't say by how much, but not much. But I made the cut. And we're retiring, and we're being brought back to consult and help out. Um, Gen Xers, 65 to 80, those are my children, right? Mid-tier and upper, upper management. Millennials, 81 to 96, young leaders, smaller management. And we're talking my grandchildren. Now, I've got one grandchild in there, and the rest are down below. But uh, we've, got, uh, we've got one in that group, but there's a lot of people with grandchildren. That are in that range, right? And then the Gen Zs, if that's you, if you fit in that category of 97 to 23 range, you always go out, have dinner with somebody, some young engineer. <laughs> we always say, Well, how old are you? And they say, Oh, I was born in 89. I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's what I enjoy doing. You know, thanks for that, you know. But uh, it's uh, it's a reality. And it's it's about that group of people, and and between the millennials, uh, the generation that we refer to as millennials and Gen Z, that is the future. That is the future. And next slide. That's the next generation right there when they find out they're it, right? And uh, it's uh, it's kind of a Bill Murray moment, if you will. Next slide, David. But we're talking about what's needed. We need the best and the brightest. Right, I think y'all fit into that. You're here, innovative and creative thinkers. Got us all some problems. If it was easy, we'd already figured it out. The demands are going to be different. Requirements and specs are going to be different, and it, it takes fresh eyes and fresh thinking. Going to create that new paradigm. Okay, of being told it isn't possible, and now it's possible. Hard work. There's never. There's never a lack of hard work and a lot of teamwork. And as the Navy still say, the easiest day was yesterday. And, and that's so true in our industry. Sacrifice, success will always demand sacrifice. There'll be times in your life where things are out of balance and you gotta you gotta do what you gotta do and then make up for it later through the vehicle. But sacrifice is key. And the core values are integrity, courage, and dependence. Being courageous in what you do, being a leader. Um, and uh, these are all traits of leader. We need strong leaders. We need strong leadership and we need strong leaders. Right? So if you fit into all those, and there's a time to recognize when you lead and when you follow. And by following your leader, believe it or not, recognizing when that's the leader. Okay. And and this is so true in the mining industry. Just remember. You may go into a meeting, you're building consensus, and it's not going to be halves, and you may not agree, but you got to get behind everything else and make it work, and be committed to that. Okay. Dave? I love this picture. <laughs> this is the, the gentleman who got off shift late out in Kentucky. He promised his son, who was a big Cats fan, Kentucky Wildcats fan, to go to the basketball game. And he was going to make sure. That he didn't miss that. That's exactly what I was talking about before. It's about that commitment. It's about that integrity. Your word is gold, right? And he didn't have time to shower, clean up, and he didn't care. And the coach gave him box tickets for the next few games as a result of it. He was overwhelmed with this guy's commitment to his family. So I just, and I think that's right. So we're diggers and we run, right? So. Dave, so what questions do you have? We're, we're here to ask, answer any questions you might have. I hope we've given you an awareness about all these different 
I do have one other statement I'll make. But I said I talked about thorium and uranium. Do you know why uranium is used for nuclear fuel? Do you know why uranium was used to make the first nuclear weapon? They had a choice. They could have picked thorium or they could have picked uranium. And they picked uranium because you can make weapon grade material off the waste of plutonium that's produced. And that's why they, they didn't go with thorium. There's quite an effort, there's still a pretty good effort moving forward. There's a lot of thorium in rare earths and it has to be handled responsibly. There's, and there's some people that are looking at the old pedal reactors, um, which could be uh, a good source of uh, uh, for, you know, nuclear power. If you had, it's very stable. And if you had a thorium reactor in Japan, it would have continued to operate. It would not have had a meltdown and leakage. It would just keep going. Right? There are some, there are some takeaways. As, as with anything, there's always positives and negatives. Right? So, okay. What questions do you have? Um, I, I, I can tell you that SME plays a huge role in your career and enhancing your career and the opportunities. And if you're not a member, I really encourage you to sign up. It's not that expensive. And uh, you get a lot out of it. So thanks for listening. Thanks for taking the time. But we're happy to answer any questions you might have. Mm -hmm. All right. <clears throat> uh, given that there's a lack of younger people going into mining, I know from my own personal experience, I didn't really hear about the benefits of mining growing up. It wasn't until I got into college that yeah. it really came about. Uh, do you think that SME going forward would try and have like a national outreach to like elementary and middle schoolers through like maybe some type of publication or a- Well, we do a lot of that right now. Okay, just, just for FYI, we have a, a mineral uh, education coalition and they go around to all the teachers' conferences and giving them free materials to use in their classrooms. And so, and, and information so they can come back and ask for more, right? Um, we, yeah, okay, let me add, yeah, homework help on the MEC, Minerals Education Coalition website. You can go in there, you, if you're a teacher, you can put an age, get an age appropriate activity that demonstrates some of the, um, some of the important aspects of mining and whatnot. So you can go in there and say, you know, fifth grade, eighth grade, 12th grade, and uh, we can, uh, it'll, it'll load you up with some activities for teachers and whatnot. So yeah. um, there, we do do a lot. Um, um, our SME Foundation, uh, we probably spend uh, three, four hundred thousand dollars a year putting curriculum into uh, the teachers. And you know what? We need to do 10 times that, to be honest with you. NSSGA does a lot. The National Sand and um, Stone, Stone, yeah, Stone and Sand Association, Gravel Association. They do a lot. I think NMA does a lot. But uh, we're, we're, you know, it's more about SME doing a lot in that area. But we got to quit preaching to the, part of the choir. Okay. We tend to talk a lot to ourselves. We are getting out, getting our local sections to go out into high schools. And, and you know, sometimes high school is too late. You still got to do it. However, if you can get into that primary education, you know, first grade through sixth grade, that's a prime time because the awareness is so keen and they talk about it. And, uh, you know, it, it takes volunteers. It takes boots on the ground. It takes volunteers, people that want to put a program together. If someone wanted to volunteer and say, I'm going to make this school mine, they could call SME and they would help you with materials and they'd help you prepare a program. Okay. So, but yeah, we got a quick free strong. And they've talked about jobs of tomorrow. That's one of our attempts um, to get out and talk about us. And trust me, it's not going to talk about what Dr. Miller teaches and the fundamentals. It's going to talk at a higher level uh, with some new key buzzwords of today that attracts people. Because I think as you said, once you get them in here and they get exposed to it, um, it it's a game changer. It, it can go off 180 degrees. Okay. I guess, like, one thing that I noticed and uh, more of like mineral dependency on other countries, uh, like, it just stood out like mica sheets. Um, like, I get it separates atomically, you can use it for like really precise measurements. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, like, if we have our own pretty solid resources on on that stuff as well, why is there as much kind of dependence? Is that more of a political game? And then if it is, like, 
is there any way that there's more lobbying that would be involved? Well, I think I think over time we've lost sight of the role of maintaining our own dependence, our independence, okay? Taking in imports and blending it and making sure that the really critical ones that we need for, for the defense industry and for other things like energy and whatnot, that we don't become dependent. I can tell you, at an SME meeting here in Denver in 1998, I was besieged by three or four guys I know who said, what the hell is SME doing about the Chinese ruining the rare earth market? Like, what, what are you talking about? That was a room on okay? I have no knowledge of rare earths. I don't even know what you're speaking of, right? And they started talking about how they were flooding the market and uh, with the product. And the United States was letting them in. So it becomes a political game of, you know, well, we got to get along type thing without setting some standards. And unfortunately, those have eroded my opinion over time. And um, and I think now people are looking back and waiting to, you know, we need to maintain some level of balance in that. But that's that's why we're like 95 or it used to be 97 i think it's like 95 percent dominant uh dominance so by china now on products you know why because they have plants sitting there they're in. and if they want to make more products and flood the market and ruin the price structure you just turn it down a little bit you know buy one of them and that goes for people who have been there and seen it people like jack Lichter. so i'll make it very simple we know how to find it we know how to extract it we operate the safest and the most environmentally friendly mines in the world. It's a political issue. Right. I guess my like, follow up to that one yeah. is with like the exploration going on, like I know there's Idaho cobalt, and then I think there's a pretty big deposit in Canada found in cobalt as well recently. Uh, just like, uh, again, like uh, geology isn't just geographically distributed. What are kind of just some of the more critical elements that we really just have zero access here to that we could start thinking about and as mining engineers how do how we make this more available i i think I, I can't answer that question totally but in general i'll say i think there's a lot more that's accessible to us here in north america because canada is an ally right and we do cross those borders on you know canadian companies here american companies there but there's a lot of copper molecules sitting waiting to be developed, okay? And they're very sensitive areas, so they're taking their time. I'll answer your question with a question. Okay. How many years does it take to develop a mine in Canada, in Australia? Mm -hmm. Two to four years. That's the number of people are talking. You know what it is here today? It's eight to 12. And we used to say four to five. And just since I worked for Newmont back in 1989, we've gone from three to three to four, or five to six, to six, and now it's eight to 12. And if you look at the uh, resolution, they've been at 19 years. It's going to be. And then we're going to talk about EVs. I'm going to go on my soapbox here, though. Sorry. Um, <laughs> we're going to talk about EVs. We're going to talk about alternative energy. We're going to talk about all this you know, good stuff. And how we're going to do it, and we're not going to burn any more fossil fuels. Great. And then we put two, we take a very good polymetallic mine in northern Minnesota that's being done carefully and being done properly, and we put it on a 20 year moratorium. And we have a leader that stands up and says, Good God, man, we want to do the technology stuff, the high tech stuff. Anybody can dig a hole in the ground. He just insulted every engineer that works in the mining industry because obviously there's some mines that fall down if you don't do them right. So my point is, and that's my opinions. Um, Eric will tell you, and the others that don't need to tell you, but not bashful. But we've got to we've got to come up we've got to come up with the right answer, bipartisan doesn't matter. We got to do what's right. We and we can do it. We can do it safely. We can do it environmentally responsibly, and and there's just lots of lots of opportunity. You're right. There is a mine in uh, Idaho that they just started up a coal mine mine. It's getting going, and that's a big plus. But again, it took how many years of people fighting and, and you know trying to kill it. And the same thing's true in Arizona. There's a lot of copper in Arizona. 
A lot of copper in the ground up in Upper Michigan, too. Eight of them. Like, I guess then with that issue of, of also kind of the transparency or even just said, oh, it's just taking a hole in the ground anyone can do it. That's obviously, you know, an issue of just lack of understanding or transparency. Again, like if if a mining company, because it's not just on SMEs, not just individual engineers, it should also be on companies. Uh, like how do you as a company be more transparent without giving away too much? Well, I think we're pretty transparent because we have to produce technical reports now. They have to be certified by a third party or registered member, also known as a qualified person. Um, you have community town hall meetings where you lay out the plans and you talk in detail. You have to bear your soul to the uh, uh, environmental protection agency. Uh, everything has to be accounted for. I mean, you're required to report on greenhouse gases, okay, GHGs. You're required to report on, I mean, good God, we thought we knew everything about soccer. Unfortunately, we didn't when we started up, you know, some of those um, mines out there. And we had some problems with waterfall, but we fixed it, okay? Had a huge fine. Back in 1990, you know what a duck cost? A waterfall more than one duck. $30,000. And if there was some little mouse that they found dead on the edge of the town's reclaimed, the, the water reclaimed area, that was about five. And it's like, is that mouse really important? I guess it is in the ecosystem somewhere. But we found a way to do it better. Okay. Because we didn't want to go through that. We didn't want that reputation. We want to be known as the people who can do it better. And um, there was a lot of people put, put a lot of work into that. And um, Sir, back there. So you were talking about all the major needed on mining industry, which uh, I have a question for you personally. Do you think there needs to be a restructure of the educational system of colleges into like applied sciences towards the mining industry? Right now we have 13, 13 accredited mining schools of different proportions, some just mining. Uh, some just geology or, or geology and mining. Um, I, I, you know, we really struggled to maintain those programs. Okay, and um, I think there there are some movements afoot to do some things better. Like in Arizona, they had the Lowell Institute that they put in place. Uh, some things they've done here. Um, you know. There's a, uh, to kind of answer your question, there's a bill that was proposed, bipartisan bill that was proposed in the Senate by Senator Barrasso from Wyoming and Senator Manchin from West Virginia. And it's called the Mineral, Mineral Schools Reinvestment Act. Reinvestment Act. He was involved in that. But we were asked to help with some of the technical details and how to do it. And it basically would put money out there for promoting Mining school, edu uh, mining schools, and helping them with um, whatever you want to use it for: equipment, facility, salary, recruitment of students, whatever, right? And uh, scholarships, but um, it would be a sizable amount of money that would be available uh, starting immediately once they pass it until like 2030. I think this uh, was the goal one. That would make a huge difference, and I think it would really help attract people into. We had a Doug Silver tell you about the uh, the twelve year super cycle that ran in gold, precious metals, and during that time, I saw people who were playing football at Montana Tech, right? Because we did a lot, of, uh, you know, did a lot of collaboration with, with them up there, and I saw guys that were playing football that had no assigned, you know, major yet, and they saw people getting these internships and making real good money. Right for a summer, and then they saw them graduate, and the numbers were really going up at that time, and the enrollment went up. Now that's cooled off, and so some things have pulled back. The part of the issue is getting mining education requires laboratories, and they're not the biggest department. So the amount of square footage to the number of butts in the seat is a big deal. Okay, so. I just want to one. call that. So, if you were talking about metallurgists, and there's extractive metallurgists, physical metallurgists, I think the extractive got 
we are the actual earth science because we deal with the rocks and processing part of it from the mining engineers. Would it be better to just make a conglomerate of all the process, like downstream and upstream? Some school are doing that actually. Virginia Tech does that, and, and they throw mining and metallurgy together. Not so much geology, but but I mean there are some schools doing that. So. Yes. What things do you think RS and the chapter can do to help with mineral education in grade school and recruiting more mining engineering students? What can the chapter do? Yeah, like our student chapter. I'd encourage you to get out to the high schools. I actually think if you, cool. if you could get out to the high schools in, in the area or wherever you're from, I think getting out to those kids and knowing uh, you know, those that are uh, STEM qualified Hey, let me tell you a statistic. You guys will find this interesting. So, you know, we work with all those schools Mark just talked about. Virginia Tech is one of the schools that has the big mining program. It was, pro it was probably, if it's not still the biggest, it, it was one of the biggest in the country for a while. So they admit 2,000 engineering students a year at Virginia Tech. Before COVID, about 20 students a year that came into Virginia Tech could not handle calculus. Post-COVID, post this year, 2,000 students admitted into engineering at, at Virginia Tech. Guess how many students had to start at pre-calculus because they couldn't handle calculus? 500 students yeah. out of the 2,000. I mean, I about fell out of my chair when when I was told that. But uh, you know, that's that that's why we have to get to those kids too. By the way, that have some STEM uh, uh, skills. You know, right. we we need to get to those kids who have engineering interests, science interests, uh, kids that have gone through you know chemistry and physics in school, kids who have gotten to calculus in high school. If we can get to those kids. All we need is a small percentage of those people. And, uh, and we're gonna do really well. Going back to Jobs of Tomorrow for a minute, we, the um, freebie has 240 million subscribers. I only wanted 1% to watch our, our shows. <laughs> I don't know if that'll happen or not, but I said, if we got 2.4 million people to watch our, uh, our Jobs of Tomorrow, we would have hit a grand slam home run at SME with that, we thought. Because Mark is right. We are fantastic. We we talk to ourselves so much in this industry; it's unbelievable. We're awesome at it. We're terrible at talking to the people that need to hear the story. I want to catch a couple more questions right here. Um, in your opinion, what's the economics problem at the end of this I'm sorry, I'm hard to hear. So yes, yeah. um, in your opinion, what is the toughest problem in the industry that you think is not currently being addressed? Not currently being addressed. Wow. Yes. Wow. I okay, think, well, there, there's probably two that I would say a lot. The first one is the permit. Shorten up the, sh the permit, not just for, well, we really need this one for an EV. Do it across the board because what you don't understand, what they don't understand is it's required across the board because all of them are going to be required in some, some shape or fashion. Okay. They think, oh, copper, it's easy. So I would say that's one, and I don't see it being addressed. I really don't. We're talking, then they talk, but you know, nothing, nothing ever changes. It gets, it actually gets worse. Part of the problem is people come in with agendas, okay? Personal agendas. That's political. I would like to see, you know, our representatives, our leaders, do what's right for the country, okay, and and come together with that mantle instead of. An individual agenda, and and so many times you have a great eight year run with a president, and, and you're doing great, and then the next one comes in, and you get eight years of holy crap, right? Because they got an agenda. Al Gore tried to kill money. I'm serious. He tried to kill money, and they did a damn good job of making it really hard, right? And I'm not saying Clinton did, but I'm saying Clinton was right there urging them off. Okay. Bottom line, we came out of that and, and we survived. But they made it really tough trying to trying to make us go away. Um, 
does do you not understand you need mining? What happens when mining shuts down? So it, you know, he, he the ironic the, the ironic part is Al Gore's fortune of his family came from mineral leases on zinc mines in Tennessee. Okay. So silver spoon effect, and I'm getting real personal now. <laughs> yes, sir. What's the of coal mining in the context of the big uh, energy transition from fossil fuel? So, I understand the push out of coal mining when we're taking into concept of uh, energy transition from fossil fuel. From fossil fuels to to other forms, I don't see a plan other than it's going to happen. And it's, they're setting target dates of like 2035, we're going to all have EVs in California. Right? Who's going to make them? Where's the material? You know, auto, auto companies are setting up for it, but I don't see anybody making the minerals for it. I can tell you that I started in the rare earth business in 2012, 2011, after I got I retired from New and then went on to another company. This whole thing started about 2008, right? Focused on mirrors. I can tell you, I don't think there's been the square root of diddly done in progress in this country. We have no downstream production. Great, you're making a product out of Mountain Bass. Where does it go? China. Why? Because they got the plants. One of the smartest things done was by Energy Fuels here in Denver, who picked up a uh, some monazite sands and they're processing it for the rare earths taking the uranium byproduct out and processing that because they are permitted to produce uranium and i think that's a really you know they're permanent they can really speed up and they are sending their demonstration plant products overseas to uh, neo performance materials uh, neo materials um in estonia so just got there's so many here yeah, yeah i have more of a metallurgy question I guess uh, over the summer, they used to joke with our metallurgists that the uh, tailings pond of our tier three deposit would be a world class gold deposit because our recovery is so bad. Um, do you ever think we'd be able to extract the metal out of those pines as like a part of it? We're recycling like all these old cars and we're recycling. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of movement afoot on shaking pines and old tailings deposits and reprocessing them. Um, you can look at you can look at the tailings that. There's elements in there that people didn't look at before we get thrown away because they looked at gold, they looked at silver, and that was it. Okay. But there might be some rare earth elements in there, like we have any of that. And I don't know. It, you have to go through the drill. One of the best things you can do is get yourself a couple of classes on mineral economics before you graduate, because you'll use them later and you'll you'll remember I said this. Because it's really important to understand the economics behind that decision making process. So, yeah. At the beginning, you mentioned that there is a new group of seniors who are uh, retiring from the industry, moving positions, and new, new engineers are getting into country. But there is also a generation, a generation of change in the party, the people who teach a component of people. And nowadays, we can see schools flooded with uh, uh, research associates, but not that many teaching professors. Is there any policy from the ESA to about this issue? Because there are no schools for professors right now. Dave. Well, we're, um, I can't speak to what the requirements are for professors at various universities. I'm sure there's a couple of people in the room that can do that better than I. Um, Dave, you, thought, you want to talk real quick about PhD program? So we, at SME, we, we know that there's a faculty deficiency in, in numbers at the 13 schools. And in fact, you know, for a while, we worked a lot harder to get the numbers raised in uh, uh, undergraduate students going to uh, mining schools. And actually, uh, we did really well. We, we probably doubled or tripled the number of students in mining engineering from about 04, where it was pretty low. Um, now what's happened is, is that though our faculty is you know, you know, Father Time's undefeated, right? So uh, faculty has aged. And so um, now we need to replace faculty. So about five years ago, seven years ago, our SME Foundation created a PhD fellowship career grant program. And uh, so we're, we put, we're actually doing three a year. And then uh, we have career grants for young faculty to help them get tenure at the school and whatnot. 
So between the two of them, uh, and we have all, and we have what about we have they have three years on that or four years on the PhD and three years on the career grant. We're we're working with about fifteen people at a time to try to get them either tenured or or to get a PhD. Um, and let's say we haven't been one hundred percent. We have hit a home run on the on the faculty getting tenure. That that's really worked really really well. On the PhDs, we've had some people drop out of the program, not want to continue, et cetera. Um, and so we haven't been quite as successful there, but but we still have put numerous faculty out there into the schools. And uh, I think SMEs put like $7 million into that over the last it's seven, one, eight one years. Sitting up there was the benefactor of that. Oh, that's right. Dr. Lee. Lee. That's right. <laughs> Thank you. So, but uh, <laughs> to add to what to your question, what Dave was saying, I'll get on my soapbox here. Um, there's a lot of faculty doing a lot of good things. I would encourage all faculty to build that bridge with industry. And that's what I strove to do very hard at Newmont, was to rebuild that bridge between Newmont and universities, because other universities want to be there. I can tell you, parents were so pissed off when we gave him money for the screen, the, the Sony Tron up at uh, Montana Tech because we had, they had new month banners flying everywhere. And uh, Denny Washington was even more upset because it was bigger than the screen he donated to, to the uh, University of Montana in Missoula. And he was upset because he was gonna have to replace it. Replaying the brand. Bottom line is the, the faculty members, it, it's really important to build that bridge. And, and to maintain it, uh, to do real, you know, do work on real projects um, and solve problems. Get out there and spend a summer at a site. My professors, that's what they did. And I can tell you stories about that. I'm not going to waste it right now. But I can tell you stories about that. They got their hands dirty. They actually worked with mine. They come back when they taught classes. They knew what was important. They knew what was relevant. Okay. They weren't stale. But if you build that bridge and they come to you, or you go to them, either way, the students benefit out of it. And, and it really gives you a great jump start to your career. But SME's looking at and maintaining a focus on faculty and continuing to, to work that program. Yes, sir. Um, so congratulations on being able to put that with that. So again, this is the top of the model. So I feel really good about it. I think it's get more stuff out there about it resource management actually works and whatnot. Um, but my question in regards to that is there's a lot of other voices out there that are very anti-mining, anti-industrial, and they, they get a lot of screen time. They get a lot of media attention. Mm -hmm. Usually their viewpoints are portrayed in movies and entertainment. And the majority of society seems to listen to them. And whenever I talk to people about mining, they never, they're always like, what, really? That's what we have to do to get this stuff? And it's like, yeah, yeah. Um, it, is there anything that we can do to try and not just in a technical field or in an educational field, but in the broader societal field, get the, uh, the memo out there that, hey, you need us for all the stuff you want. You do need us. So that movie that says finding an industry, bad, 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 evil people, stuff like that, that's not true. Is, is there a way that we can do on the broader range rather than just the education? So one of the things that our current SME board has been really good about, it's why we did Jobs Up Tomorrow, was they recognized we've got to talk and counter some of the anti-negative uh, mining messages that are out there. So in about two weeks, we're releasing some data at, from SME on research that we've done that we basically say the green energy technology transfer stops in five years because there's no minerals to support it. We want bold statements like that so that we can grab some attention that because if you want the green economy, you want to reduce carbon emissions, whatever your agenda is, it's going to yeah. stop in five years if we're not able to, to produce more minerals uh, going forward. So we, we're working with that. We're, we're issuing a press release. We're going to the New York Times. We're going to the Washington Post. We're going to... Uh, you know, ABC, NBC, CBS, and whatnot, because that's where we're going to have to go in order to, and we're going to, 
unfortunately, we got to roll up our sleeves and, and, and get into a fight that I'd prefer not to get into, but it really is what we're going to have to do. So right now, I'm very proud of our SME board because they really have recognized that that's something we have to do, and they've authorized me and our staff to, to kind of push forward with some of this stuff. And so it's a PR agency that we hired that's putting all this together, that we're dropping all of these uh, you know, statistics. Here's another one, and, and because it, it's familiar to me, I'll share it with you. How much copper is produced in the world? About 21 million tons a year right now. Okay, how much copper are we gonna need if we're gonna electrify cars, windmills, solar panels? We're gonna need, on a con very conservative basis, we're gonna need somewhere between six and eight million tons more per year. You're gonna be doing it at mines that are half the grade that they were 50 years ago. So that means you gotta move twice as much dirt. You know, it's, it, it, it's those kinds of things the public doesn't understand. And, you know, it, we've, got to, we've, got to, we've got to take that message. We've got to make it pretty simple. And, uh, you know, Mark's slide up here that said we have to open 300 mines. Well, it's 359 from SME's estimate, to be specific. But more importantly is people don't understand if I say we open 350 more, not, 359 more mines, you know, that'll take care of the problem. Well, in reality, we don't really know that it's 359. We just need a number to get the public's attention because we don't know what the org rate's going to be. We don't know how big the, the deposit is, et cetera. So maybe you could do it with 300 mines. Maybe we need 450. But we, we've done some calculation and we picked 359 because that's the number we want to go with because it keeps it simple. Because we can say we need open 359 mines in order to meet the green economy. But we get, and we're really dumbing down the message, but that's what we, what we really have to do. And uh, we're going to do some more of that, I think, going okay, forward. You so. next, I, I just want to add one thing. It's not about the size of the dog in the fight, it's about the heart. And as you know, I have so many friends tell me that they were told they could never succeed. They could never do this. They could never do that. Now the multi no yes, because they continue with the fight. And that's really what we have to do. Each and every one of you is a member of SME or a member of the mining community is an ambassador, is an ambassador for the mining industry. So when you have friends that are talking that way, just produce facts. Just produce facts. And let them think about it. Buy them a beer, right? Yes. Buy them a drink and talk facts. And you would be amazed how many people you went over. Unfortunately, there's going to be some that just deny and aren't. And I'd suggest you need to change up your friends. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's obviously a huge pain for growth in the mining industry. Is SME, the mining industry in general, doing a lot to affect policy associated with mining? I want the executive director because his rule number one, he told me, when he said, You're going to be the president in 2023. He said, I have rule number one that you will not disobey. I said, Okay, what's that? He said, Dave doesn't look good in jumpsuit orange. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Rule one in SME is I'm not going to jail for SME. That's the uh, But uh, uh, your question about policy specific was so there's obviously this huge what are we doing? For, um, mining and critical minerals. And there's been a lot of policy saying we're going to have this many EVs by 2030 and all that, and it's unrealistic. So you're right. So net zero carbon that's a fantasy world people live in. Okay. We're going to use carbon. We're going to use coal for the rest of our life. It may be on a significantly reduced basis, but we're going to have some need for it, period, in the discussion. As far as um, where we're going forward, I mean, you know, um, there, if you can, you can YouTube it, but, you know, uh, Congressman McClintock from California, he gave a lecture in uh, one of the hearings recently, I think it was back in November, where he basically said, you can't say we're going to have all these mandates for electrical vehicles and whatnot, and then say we're not opening any mines. Yeah, yeah, and, you know, you, you can't talk out of both sides of your mouth like that. So that really is, is, is an issue. And, uh, you know, we're going to have to, you know, have to fight good fight there to, to try to get mines open, get people to understand what it takes to, to move forward with, uh, it's, it's with the things that we need. Yeah, as far as policy, SME is a 501c3. Not for profit. C six trade organizations can do a lot of lobbying. We cannot. We're limited in what we can do. 
we basically wait for that call to ask us to help. We have some work to do with NIAPS right now where they ask us to apply and uh, give them a proposal to do some work for them. And, and that's great. And so we wait, but we, in the meantime, when we have a government uh, political action committee that uh, puts together technical briefings, and they are on the web page, you can look them up. You can do a search on technical. So briefings. here's where I'm going to keep Mark legal. We don't have a political action committee. No, so no, no. We, not can't that. That. we, have, a, we have a government <laughs> and public affairs there, committee. There, there you go. <laughs> now I won't go to jail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but what we do is we provide input and technical facts and data to congressmen or their staff who want details and facts when they go to committee hearings. And and that's that's what we can we do. Don't have, as, as you guys might know, uh, Senator Manchin uh, is is pushing to get copper on the critical minerals list from the USGS. And this morning, what did I do? I, everybody that co-sponsored that bill, I sent them a technical paper about the importance and, and the, the issues of copper so that they would hopefully not go on Hannity and, and act idiot like an idiot talking about mining. Uh, so, uh, and you know, and it's those kinds of things. We take those opportunities when we can to get information in and, and hopefully educate uh, people that need to be educated. Yeah, I mean, you might as well have had an avatar last night on there. I didn't talk about it was. Uh, you mentioned the uh, SME and the 501. Uh, the 501 is like not for profit. Uh, that industry lobbying organization, by the way, is there sort of a correspondence that is under that classification? C6, C6 yeah. do lobbying, and that would be like National Mining Association, AEMA, which used to be known as Northwest Mining, uh, American Exploration Mining Association, not as Spokane. Um, your, your, your state mining associations like CMA and Nevada Mining Association, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. But C6 is, there's a whole list of C's. But C6 is definitely your trigger. So it starts at 501C1, goes all the way to 501C29. Um, we're a C3, SME is. Trade associations are C6s. Churches are mostly C4s. Uh, trade unions, labor unions, or C-16s, you know, so it's all of the IRS's classification for all types of organizations, um, and, and each of them come with some restrictions. C-6 is, our, is the most restricted um, nonprofit designation you can have, because we can't donate to a PAC, we can't support anybody for public C office, we can't promote for a bill or anything like that, but we can educate to our heart's content. Yeah. Uh, going to school here, we hear a lot about your more standard uh, metals and aggregates operations, but we don't hear a lot about uh, rare earths, you know, not being an emerging field. I was wondering if you could just speak on your experience in that sector of our industry and how we have uh, different uh, challenges with the metal operations. Van puts some air plugs. Do you man puts some air plugs? <laughs> um, there's a lot of a lot of work being done, a lot of testing, a lot of drilling, a lot of you know, definition. The problem I have was there, there really is only one rare find in the United States, and that's not that. Okay. It's got um, six trucks. What's that? <laughs> and it has six haul trucks. <laughs> yes. There's one in Mount Well in, in um, Australia. They send their product over to Malaysia to be refined, and then they send it to the Chinese. Hey, Mark, can I step in here for just a second? Because yeah, people sorry. are starting to leave, yeah, but I understand. We're over but I got time. I got to do one more thing. We got to give away those books. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So who has the closest date to May 23rd for a birthday? June 17th. June 17th. <laughs> June 7th. June 7th. May 21st. April. 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 April 30th. April 30th. So I'm thinking June 7th is huh? Oh. May 21? Yeah. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I, mean, I don't need it. Like, no, 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 <laughs> it's yours. I don't even want it. Let's do underground mining. Let's do underground. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, who's got the closest birthday to June 12th? June 17th. June 8th. Yeah. Well, five days away. There you go. So, you know what those dates were? May 23rd is Mark's birthday, June 12th is mine. 
It's important for our show. From I have the railroad companies, and there's a lot of them, and most are on the dot me that doesn't sell. Um, the PSX dot me. Um, they never get past the PDA, or they just get to a PFM. They don't do anything. They're waiting for the big buy. And the problem is there's no downstream. I can tell you my experience is I worked in the industry over 50 years. Thank you. 745. I've never seen a more complex group of metals because when you buy it, you're getting 50 that you're at, that you're looking at, which one to concentrate and keep, which ones to throw away. And they're very complex in their separations, very difficult. And it's so, it, but oh, okay. Now I mean just three or four nines on site powder. Look at me, isn't that special? What are you gonna do with it? You can't use well, some powders can be used polishing. There, there are a few things like powders and fusions, but it's for this one. The important ones, you can't do anything with them, right? And so it's the only industry I've ever seen when you have to think about the downstream. I gotta walk over here and I go, you, you know that plan you got? I want to be the supplier, let's sign an agreement, okay? Then you gotta go over here and you say. I got this powder and I'm going to have it made into metal. Oh, you don't do that? Oh, can you make alloy? Okay. Can you turn that oxide powder into metal? I mean, there's so many steps of refining. And sometimes you just sell the concentrate. Can you separate these things? I don't know what the hell I'm doing. I got to separate it. <laughs> Each box is another box. And I've never seen a more complex system in my life compared to this. And so it was a big learning. You know why? I used to love going to Justin Matthew before. It's like the Wizard of Oz. No, 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 sorry, I'll just. Yeah, I guess the door right here. Yeah. It's open door and moved up. You didn't care about purity. They'd tell you what purity was, and then they'd pay. Even, even concentrates, copper concentrates. The Sarah has a long time. I mean, amen. you better be about the entire stream, and you better not start producing until you've got the market sort of done. So, we kind of on that. What's your take of that? I'll be on this to get into more history and how hard it is to process battery during the field. It is going to happen. I mean, people are ramping up for it. They're going to find ways to do it. They're going to find ways to do it better. I mean, it's kind of like space mining. Right, that you offer here. Hell, we haven't figured out how to do it right here. What the hell are you doing worrying about up in space? Right? But the point is, I think that you're going to learn a lot of things. And if it's funded and you get money from the government, that's great. Do I think I'll receive it? Hell no. But I think it's important because of the things you may learn that apply here yet to discover and get that mind rolling in the right way. Right? So, you, you know, I, there's there's a lot there's there's a lot to be done. There's a lot to be done. Um, I think the lithium market. I just saw an article this morning said lithium is going to be an oversupply for the next five years. So that's going to do that's going to damage the market. <laughs> so what are we going to do? I think the government needs to step in, buy a stockpile, you know, and and then sell it back. Do something like that. Otherwise, you're going to you're going to have companies that are starting up that are going to go. So, yeah. but then again, you have to get permits to process purchases <laughs> and even choice. Going back to that waste mining and the stuff you put on there about the research grants for coal refuse and rare earth, mm -hmm. we had a guy out of the mine I worked at the summer doing that. What do you think? Do you think companies will get in to actually do that, especially with coal, where you have a bunch of environmental groups where that are really yeah. on your back about all that? Do you think it's like you want my honest opinion? Yeah. <laughs> I don't think there'll be a gram of rare earth manufactured for commercial production from coal. However, that said, I think it's great the government's putting money because they don't know any better. They're putting money into the schools again, which we weren't getting grants, and um, supporting mining schools. Take it. Let's do it. Why not? The other thing is, it's a technology, it's a talent, it's skills that we've lost, that we've forgotten about. 
and we need to reacquire it in our research and knowledge. So I think from that standpoint, it's great. Will there ever be any? We might be in a pitch. And you know what? Uh, good. I have a theory, though. Pennsylvania boy. We call them strip jobs. They strip the coal out. He had a round top in the center. Uh, so Grandpa sold the farm for the coal company, and then we reclaimed the back. And we didn't push the dirt back and re smoke it. We just planted it. But that coal that came out of there had a shell layer over top. It had a shale layer underneath. And one of the things that Tom Gray, the Tech Tech back in Pittsburgh, and I've been talking about, and he's actually gone out and proven it. Doesn't occur everywhere, but we're seeing it. There's rare earths in the coal, and it ends up in the ash. How did it get there? Well, I got cooked, but we think that another possible mechanism was water leaching of that out of the, you know, that oxide out of the shale and went into the coal and act like activated carbon, and it picked it up. And I said, Tom. You need to go in and sample the shale layer right above it or right below it. And they did. And you know what they found? Better grade. Better grade. So there's there's a mechanism in there that's that's going on and it's not uniform because where are certain so low grade and whatnot. It's you know, it doesn't always do that, but we're seeing a lot of that. Okay. So one last question. Yes, sir. Um, you talked about how SME is incorporating a lot of different aspects kind of throughout the mine process and throughout getting uh, these critical minerals. Are you, does SME also reach out to companies such as Tesla, which does the battery manufacturing, to work specifically on end of life designs? So that way, the material at the end of that product's life is easier for getting recycled and mineral processing or recycling um is SME kind of reaching out to those kind of end use product majors so that way sme is an organization i can say and can probably say is is not but we have members who are okay people that are interested in that aspect of it and um, either either as a private consultant or, or another company that can make use of that or want to get in that part of the business. But yeah, recycling is is a big um, a big push in that area. And of course, as you as you know, if you go and work with them ahead of time, you can you can do a lot more with that. Um, one of the greatest examples I saw was um, up in Stillwater, the the platinum PGM company up there. Which is now, um, yeah, I can't remember the name. Anyway, African company bought them out. But anyway, they built a refinery in Colombia. Okay, right? Or is it Columbus or Columbia? Columbia, Montana. Columbus. Columbus, Montana, which is just outside of Billings, right? And they go and bid on catalytic converters and they come in and crates and they use that to supplement their feed. And at the same time, uh, recycling the PGMs out of those catalytic converters, and there's nickel and other things. And they've got a great process. You know who built it? They did. They had a downturn, and they didn't know if they were going to survive. And so instead of laying everybody off, they formed teams with, and they, okay, this guy's a really good project guy. This guy's a really good steel and Russian guy. You know, this guy's really good at you know, this. This person over here can do this, that, and they formed teams. And they engineered it, and they brought in engineers, structural engineers, to do the drawings and certify them. But they put everything together themselves, and they built the process. They built everything from scratch. And spec if they had to have a, um, a, you know, like an autoclave made, they would spec. They put the specs on that and work with the autoclave. Group. So, and they they go through a tremendous amount of uh, of uh, catalytic converters. Probably one of the years, it got ripped off your car at your house, you know. <laughs> Our daughters had had uh, three or four attempts at taking the catalytic converter off the car. It's a big deal, a lot of money. So, so yeah, there is there is efforts going on that. We see that, and we see sessions and papers presented, kind of that. We see we see more of that in uh, in the conference proceedings. Okay.
Okay, thank you very much. It's been great. I appreciate it. By the way, there's stuff here.